Representative Jerry Newton sponsors House File 1916, which would create a way to commemorate women veterans through specialty license plates. Newton says the bill was originally met with resistance and was hard to get a committee hearing. According to the representative, the feeling in both the House and the Senate was that no more specialty license plates should be added to those already in circulation. But advocates for the women veteran license plates argued that the plates would go a long way in recognizing their contribution. We've got a very effective uh, female veteran lobby. There are 29,000 female veterans in Minnesota, some of them going back to World War II, who feel that they haven't been um, honored to the extent that male veterans have been. And uh, oftentimes, as they tell me, someone will see a license plate on their car for Iraqi War veteran or a Gulf War veteran, and the person pulling up next to them will say, thank your husband for his service, when it's the women who actually perform the service. And so they feel uh, left out, and uh, I've got some real champions in the uh, women's veterans movement. Under the bill, the plates would bear the inscription, Woman Veteran. Newton describes how that could look. The Department of uh, Transportation now, rather than making new license plates, they have uh, decals that will go on the plate, so it looks like it's the, the stamped license plate. So it's not as expensive as it used to be to make personalized plates. Newton, a Vietnam veteran, says it means a lot to him to be able to pay tribute to those he served with. The bill is before the House Ways and Means Committee. Let's now go to our coverage of that meeting.
Okay, I'd like to uh, convene the um, Ways and Means uh, Committee meeting. And uh, Representative Wagenius, I think you've had a chance to study the minutes. Am I correct? I know the minutes are correct. Would you like to make a motion? I would certainly do that. I will move the of uh, April 3rd. April 3rd. Day. Thank you. Okay, the uh, Representative Wagenius moves the approval of the minutes for April 3rd, 2014. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, the first uh, bill we have up is uh, House File 1951. Uh, Representative uh, Murphy is the chief author, but I understand uh, Representative Nelson uh, will be uh, pinch hitting for uh, Representative Murphy. So um, the chair um, moves that House File 1951, the second engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Um, and uh, there is um, there is an Some author's amendment. Do you want to do the amendments before you explain the uh, bill, Representative Nelson? Um, I'll do the author's amendment. I'd like the author's amendment, which is the 18A amendment, 19, H1951 18A. That's just a technical amendment, changing some dates uh, and correcting on 213 or 212, uh, correcting uh, uh, the statute quote that's in there. Um, it's basically a technical amendment. Okay, so the uh, I will move the 18A amendment, um, and if you could uh, entertain any questions, technical, seen none. It's technical. It's just in, changing dates and, and correcting date changes that were missing. Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, there is another amendment, the A1 amendment. Yeah, this is the uh, DHS amendment. Are you familiar with that one? No, I'm not. Um, anybody that's familiar with it? Uh, It's just striking. Requested by DHS. Is somebody DHS. here from DHS that uh, can explain you, the amendment? What, uh, he, can, he can explain that. I'm not aware of because I was asked to pitch in for Mary. I wasn't aware of the two the, amendments. Uh, it meant the timeline. I um, We got an email mm -hmm. uh, from DHS on it. And so uh, uh, if uh, you could identify yourself, sir, for the record, and then maybe explain the need for the amendment. Yes, good morning. My name is Jim Yates. I'm the Assistant HR Director for the Minnesota Department of Human Services. This is a technical amendment, and it simply um, is needed to correct the job title for licensed practical nurse. Previously, the job classification title had the number one at the end of it. That one has been removed, so the statute, need, the SERP statute, needs to be amended to strike the number one. Okay. Any uh, discussion? When you mentioned it, I think yeah. I remember the uh, yeah, no. that that. Uh, it reduces the number of classifications, and am I correct in that? Correct. To uh, okay. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none. Then all those in favor signify by. S mm -hmm. Did I move the? Uh, yeah. yeah, I did move the. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Um, we now have the uh, A16 amendment. Uh, Representative Kahn. Yes. So, Chairman, uh, I'll move the amendment. Okay, Representative Kahn moves the A16 amendment. Uh, Representative Kahn, if you'd okay. explain the amendment. Uh, yes, this amendment asks the three major pension funds to provide the leg legislature with a report on the effect of the phased early retirement options. Some of you guys may remember that because each of the three big pension pa plans were allowed to institute PERO programs. And these programs allow somebody, usually over age 62, to retire and collect the pension and have an agreement to work up to half time and get paid from their employer. The reason usually given is that the employee has particular expertise that we don't want to use and is valuable to the employer. This all sounds very good. And in the current bill is an extension of the PERO program for PERA for eight years until 2022. 
but the problem is I don't think we've looked critically at the program when we approved it. And this is one of the things, this use of early retirement was one of the things that just absolutely killed the MRF pension plan, which we're still paying, uh, paying to bail out. But um, the, the plans in the pension groups pushed the early retirement programs because they sounded very good at the time. We'll let someone retire and we hire someone new for a lower salary. It's win-win. Uh, do we think so? But we wound up paying people longer because they retired earlier. And the payment, so it's a win for the system and a loss for the pension plan. The system gets the profit with the pension pa plan paying the, differ the difference. But, so maybe it's okay, maybe it's all all right, but the problem is we don't know. We put it in and we don't know the facts. And that's all this amendment is asking for is the facts. So everybody likes this, but what effect does it have? Employees like it, the cities and the counties and everyone likes it, but what effect does it have on the pensions themselves? And as again, as I said, this was one of the things that did in the MRF plan with a bunch of early retired. It was good for the city, but bad for the MRF. And all of a sudden the MRF account had this big increase in benefits. We ended up picking that up on the state level because it was our, so the city and the state together founded the MRF plan. So what's happening with this plan? The answer is we don't know. The state has, the state has 50 people who use it. PARA has 430 people in it. TRA has 5,000 people. And, and maybe they make jobs a bit less, that these jobs may make jobs less available for younger people. And maybe it prevents the pension funds from having more paying members. And we learn, we're learning about how hard it is for young people to have good career jobs. And maybe this is one of the things that's staying in the way. So, okay, I'm getting signs there. But, but when we did this for St. Paul teachers, we made the St. Paul school district make a contribution to pay to the pension fund to pay for the extra costs. So we're not doing anything like that here. We're just asking to study it so we'll come back next year understanding what the effect is on the pension plans. And we got one of the usual things, well, don't tell us in law to study it. We'll do it ourselves. You know, I'm just more comfortable telling them to do it because they've had plenty of time to do it themselves and they haven't. Okay, Ms. Vanek, would you identify yourself for the record and um, who you represent and give us your thoughts on the amendment? Mr. Chair and members, my name is Mary Vanek. I'm the Executive Director of PERA. I'm asking that you not you know, support... I, excuse me for a moment. I think we're having a problem. Uh, the mics must be... Okay, I, I, maybe a, um, the previous testifier was a little hard to hear as well, so there's something... It may be my distance, but, but at any rate, uh, if you could start again. Thank you. Again, my name is Mary Bannock. I'm the Executive Director of PERA. I ask that you not support this amendment in the way that it's written. Um, I respect Representative Kahn's um, interest in understanding this. I can give you some background. Before the board authorized staff to bring this to the legislature in 2009, we did an analysis of the age at which our members retire. At the time, it was under age 62. And the actuary said that by making this, this program available and knowing that under IRS rules, we can't allow someone to collect a pension and earn a salary uh, without a break in service, that this will push people to work beyond what was our average retirement age. And that is, in fact, what we are now experiencing, a positive impact by people working longer and not, not retiring to collect their pension before age 62. We did a study for the board, um, and I'd be happy to make that available. Before we asked the board whether or not they wanted to not allow this program to continue, which it set to sunset this year, July 1st, set another sunset date or make it permanent. And because the actuary indicated that we had not had enough use to do a valuable informative study on any impact to the plan, the board asked that it be continued again for a sunset date five years out, but the longer date is associated with anybody who enters an agreement in the last year, it still can extend out for five years. 
they can an individual can participate in the in this program at the uh, approval of the employer for up to a total of five years. Our experience shows that since it was implemented, there are only four individuals who have continued in the program since 2009. There are another 17 who've had renewals who are currently participating in the program since 2010. There are about 250 participants, 27% of them come from Hennepin County, 87% of the counties that are using this, or the employers that are using this program are in greater Minnesota where they have difficulty getting replacement workers for social work and for nursing and some computer analysts and programmers. And that's where we see it being used quite a bit. The average age, as I mentioned, uh, is above 62. 57% of the participants in the past were ages 62 through 64. 43% of them ranged in ages from 65 through 77. Now you need to understand that if these individuals weren't in the phased retirement program, they could be rehired as re-employed retirees and have no earnings limitation whatsoever. In the phased retirement program, they can't work more than a 50% full-time equivalent to participate in this program program. If they were re-employed retirees over the age of 65, they could come back and earn anything. I appreciate what Representative Khan is interested in. I would like to let her know that the board has directed that staff come back with a, a suggestion, a recommendation on how we deal with re-employed retirees, and that would bring this group in if we, in fact, find that having the employer at least make an employer contribution on the earnings of these folks who are already drawing would benefit the fund. Right now, we simply don't have enough data to make a meaningful, con to arrive at a meaningful conclusion. We are, however, I have a staff person right now running a report with the individuals who are in the phased retirement program, what their pension is, what their salary was at the time of retirement, and what they are earning now. And I have every intention of making that available to the LCPR. Um, but going beyond with the mean, median, average, it doesn't really provide any meaningful information because of the low utilization of this program at this point in time. Okay, Representative Khan. Well, first of all, if you listen to the last statement that Ms. Vanek made, she was really speaking in support. She said, we need to have the information, we need to look at it. It's really good that the plan is looking at it, but the legislature makes the decision. And the Pension Commission is the one who needs the information on it. And PARA is not the problem. PARA has 430, at most, according to our info, in it. TRA has 5,000. That's one of the places where we need to look at the issues. And frankly, I think the bottom line before this committee at this point is, if you believe in fact-based decisions, you should support this study. Next year, the LCPR starts all over from scratch, and it seems to me to be a good way to give them some fact-based information to make their decision, <laughs> to make their decision on. And, um, you know, if there are... This will go through the process if there are words, if we should get mean, median, et cetera, if those should be changed. Just tell us how that should be changed. Tell us how the words of the study should be changed, and we'll go ahead and do it. But if you're persuaded by anecdotal statements and seemingly plausible arguments, then just vote against this amendment. If you want data to support the decisions we're making, vote for it. You got to identify yourself. Uh, Luther Thompson, representing TRA. Uh, I don't think TRA is the problem here because we don't have a phased retirement program. But we have, as, the, as uh, Representative Khan suggested, about 5,000 members who have retired and gone back to work. Primarily, these are substitute teachers working on a part time basis. So TRA does not have a phased retirement program. There is a phased retirement program for Minsku teachers, and those Minsku teachers that are covered by TRA in the phased retirement program are about, I think it's six. So uh, we would support the comments made by Tara as well. well okay. um, why don't we, 
your first reps have come from the it looks like okay. pension plans are <laughs> want not, to, do not to comment on their position. want to do extra work. <laughs> you could also identify yourself for the record. Mr. Chair, my name is Dave Bergstrom and I'm the director of the state retirement system. We are fine with providing information. Um, we think this goes to be a little bit too much. We have 50 people on the plan, so to me it's much ado about nothing. Um, quite frankly, this did not go through the, through the pension commission. I think it would be good to get other ideas from the pension commission members to see what they like to study, rather than going through this exercise, which is going to require a lot of manual work, go to the pension commission and say, well, boy, I wish we had this and we had that. So I, Mr. Chair, I want to make it clear we're very happy to cooperate. Um, we'd like some input into the process. I think the rest of the pension commission would uh, benefit from input. Um, and as I stated earlier, we have 50 people. I'll tell you just anecdotally how we used it. We had a computer person retire. We brought him back on a part-time basis just to help coach our, our, our the rest of our computer staff. So it's it's been a good program. Uh, we'll provide information. I, I just think the study goes a little too far. Okay, uh, is there anyone else uh, that was going to comment? Okay, Representative Khan. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, if there's some work, uh, first of all, I did bring it before the Pension Committee in a much stronger form. And I didn't admit I didn't do a good enough job there. So I kept working and thinking about it. And this is the data that the Pension Commission will need to make the decision. And if there is some wording that needs to be changed in this, well, we're going through the process and we'll figure it out to make it less onerous somehow. It seems to me that I would want this kind of information before I made a decision. And remember, for all we, and, and I totally understand the importance of, you know, more so after this weekend of keeping the expertise of older people in the system. But the, um, uh, you know, but the point is this is also a way to stop younger people from getting in too. And these are some of the people we're worried about getting on a career path. And it's not a prohibition. It just gets us the data to make an informed decision instead of going through this argument again next year for the Pension Commission. So. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? <coughs> uh, Mr. And by the way, Representative Murphy is now here if you want to join us at the table or we just got started uh, and you've now arrived as the chief author. And my understanding is that Representative Murphy doesn't care, but uh, like I said, the pension, the pension plans have offered to, to look at this and, and give their information and uh, they're asking not that it not be put on. It's that, that they'll do it without the amendment again. And, and Representative Khan says that, well, we want them to do it, should do it. So I guess that's, that's where we're at. Okay, any uh, discussion? Well, seeing none, then all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. No. Think motion defeated. Chairman, I want a division on that. Okay, division has been uh, requested. Uh, all those uh, in favor of the amendment uh, signify by raising your hand. And no. Okay, seven uh, ayes and 15 no. So much, uh, Mr. Chair, your hearing's, pre your hearing's pretty good. Well, I put in a new battery. That was probably <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> while we were debating it, I had to... Uh, so, so members... Um, it is noticeable sometimes when I... Mr. Chair and members, operating. the fiscal impact, which is why we're here on this bill, is, uh, is basically in, in, in uh, Section 6 and Section 7 of the bill. Um, there are $22 million is going from the general fund cost to pay for the merger of the Duluth teachers into the TRA, and $7 million is going to pay for the sustainability of the, of, the, of the St. Paul Teachers Fund. And just a little side note, there was a study we did last year, we had, we had them do the, what the costs were, and this is what the costs came down on this, and, and whether it was feasible to do this or it was better to do this or leave them separate. Um, the study came back, if we had, do, did both of them come in, we were looking at 
instead of $7 million a year for St. Paul teachers, we were looking at having to come up with $46 million a year for St. Paul teachers to come in. So it's right now it's cost benefit to leave them on their own and, and help shore them up. Now these, these subsidies will go till there's a time certain date, and they, uh, but it also if the, the funds get to the sustainability levels, these payments drop off. Um, the other, there's another piece in the bill, section three of the bill, where we're increasing the employer and the employee by half a percent each um, payment into the funds. Um, and that's part of the Sustainability Act that we passed in 2010, that if in a two-year period prior to it that the actuarial study says that they're not sustainable, there's a deficiency in the, in the contributions that they have to be raised, and that's why we're raising them for the MSRS and the para. So that's um, as effective uh, current law, and the, the funds, I mean, the, the, the employers for PARA and the employers for MSRS have said that they will eat that cost, that they built that into their budget that we passed last year. Um, with that, members, that's the, that's the parts of the bill that bring it here. I could stand for questions. Okay, there uh, any questions of uh, Representative Nelson? Representative Abler. Oh, didn't realize I was first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Nelson. Uh, last year's bill uh, had some reforms. I think that was that last year the troopers were going to take a little cut in some of their their monthly, and they were going to there's some increased donations from various groups. And if that bill wouldn't have passed, we wouldn't have saved a half a billion dollars. I think something like that. If, I think Representative Murphy uh, kind of made that point kind of clear on the floor. Uh, can you maybe Representative Murphy? I'll ask you if you would answer the um, on this bill. If this bill doesn't pass. Are the pensions going to cost more or are they going to cost less? Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, Representative Abler, would you state the question if, if this bill doesn't pass? Right. Well, just I'll well, last year, if the bill wouldn't have passed, pensions would have cost more in Minnesota. And because, we, there, because there were some reforms and, and increased and all the convoluted things mm -hmm. that I've escaped understanding all the way, so I stay off of that commission. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but it, it, the interactions made it save, I think, a half a billion dollars over a period of time, and it made it a, a, a good kind of a reformish kind of a bill. And is there anything like that in this? And so if that bill wouldn't have passed, we wouldn't have saved a half a billion dollars. Right. If this bill passes, are we going to spend more money or less money? And Ms. Mr. Chair, <laughs> Representative Abler, thank you for bringing that topic up. The 2010 bill, bill that we passed towards sustainability saved the state six billion dollars and this then last year was half and this one is um, providing sustainability in the future because of the things that representative Nelson mentioned with the increased employer costs the employer costs on uh, for PERA, some PERA plan, uh, the general is the lowest in the country, and we're going to bring that up in a staggered, in a staggered way. And so um, we will have more sustainability in the plans, plus the benefits will be there for the retirees when they do retire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then with the, this is a, this is a takeover of the Duluth plan. If we didn't do that, would it fail soon or would it fail later? Okay. Uh, well, if we didn't do this bill, uh, what happens then? Um, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, Representative Abler, Duluth was fully funded uh, before the crash, <laughs> before 2008. They were fully funded. But since that time, um, with the crash of 2007, um, things have changed. The demographics are changing. Right now, there are 1,512 contributing teachers, and eight or in '95 there were 1,512 contributing teachers and 841 retirees. Today, in 2014, there are 800 contributing teachers and 1,500 retirees in the pension plan. So it's just done a complete switch around. Plus, the population in Duluth has not changed significantly for decades. And um, the number of students in ISD 709 has gone down from 14,000 in 1993 to 
8,300 8, in 2014. Plus, during that time, 250 teachers were taken out of the Duluth Teachers Retirement Plan through legislative action. Legislative action took the teachers at the vocational school out, or the Duluth or Lake Superior Community College out and put them in TRA. The legislative action also said that all charter schools teachers had to go into TRA. And so the combined numbers of those teachers totaled 250. And so the demographics aren't going to get any better. Thank you. And one more question, Mr. Chair. Representative Abler. You know, I might actually like to be on the Pensions Commission. I, this is all math, you know, and health care is math and pensions yes. is math, but I still don't want to be on it, so please <laughs> nobody nominate me. Um, just a final question. Uh, just, I don't know how I'm going to vote on this. I voted for every other pension bill because uh, I thought we needed to keep our promises to people. Um, and this one, I'm just trying to figure it out. And so on the Duluth package in particular, how does that compare with the average TRA package in terms of benefits and inflation and so on? Mr. Chair, Representative Abler, Duluth is the only um, only pension plan where there's been um, no COLA for two years and going on three. Right? And uh, but they will be brought up when they come into TRA. If the consolidation takes place, they will be on the same same as TRA. And just one more comment, Mr. Chair. And so it's like I think this. We did some reform in the St. Paul one when that was merged. I think they had some pretty good colas going at the time, and so they had to bring those down. Uh, so it just it would be helpful for people to know that there's been no cola for two years and they're not getting big increases. So that's helpful. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, just a correction. We, when we brought the Minneapolis teachers in, not the St. Paul oh. teachers. The St. Paul teachers are still separate. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, and I, I'm assuming that when... Uh, Representative Murphy mentions that the uh, technical college uh, was uh, taken out of the uh, Duluth plan. That happened in the cities of the first class where uniquely they had their own pension plans. And then when we merged into what we now call Minsku, um, the rest of the tech colleges around the state were already a part of TRA. But uh, the cities of the first class had their own pension plans, and I'm Assuming that was part of the driving force then that you're referring to when you say legislative uh, decision in terms right. of the uh, number of people contributing to the plan. And Mr. Chair, yeah. I would like to also mention that historically the, the plans that are in existence now um, have taken in 60 independent plans like the Duluth teachers or like the Duluth police or like Minneapolis Police and Fire kind of things, what, whatever, the three big plans, TRA, MSRS, PERA, have all consolidated smaller plans into the larger over the years of the Pension Commission. Mm -hmm. Historically, it's the right thing to do. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Representative Khan. Well, just let me point out, in 2010, the legislature passed a major benefit reduction plan that was signed by Governor Pawlenty. And Tom Hansen, who was a former House employee and the Commissioner of Finance, said that that pension bill saw, saved the state's credit rating. Right now, we're rated extremely high by the three major credit rating uh, systems. If you look like a National Association of Retirement Issues issue brief, I know it's so difficult to bring facts into this. But the um, Minnesota spends is right in the middle, spending about uh, uh, their contribution to pensions as a percentage of all state and local spending is um, 1.62 in Minnesota, and we're right in the middle in the middle of what the U.S. weighted average is 2.77. So we're doing very well, and we've really had cooperation from the plans when we've needed, and this is a good bill, and we should pass it. Could have been better, but it's still good. 
Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, Representative Detmer. Yeah, I'd like to have TRA, you know, representative come down here and just kind of explain to us, you know, what will happen if this doesn't pass or what's the future look like for these, uh, these three uh, retirement programs, the TRA, the Minneapolis, and the St. Paul. I need to know what the future is. I think Mr. Thompson is still, yeah, he's yeah. still here. Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> and then, Mr. Chair. Yeah, okay, I'm not sure. I know that there's two of you. Whichever one wants to take that uh, question, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, yeah Chairman uh, Luther Thompson from TRA. I, I'll let uh, Mr. Jay Stoffel speak on the Duluth issue. Mr. Chairman and members, my name is Jay Stoffel, and just to be clear, I want to explain that for 22 years I was the director of the Duluth plan. And as of January 6th, I became the Deputy Director of the Teacher, Teachers Retirement Association. So I'm here to help the committee understand uh, what, you need, what we, you would like to know about the Duluth plan, although I'm not with the plan any longer. Uh, Dave Johnson behind me uh, also represents the Duluth plan and can speak to the board position and so forth. But if you would like historical information or financial information about the Duluth plan, I can help the committee with that, knowing that I am a TRA employee. Okay. Representative Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my question was, you know, all three of these plans, uh, you know, are looking looking at uh, some unfunded uh, liability that we have here. And and I'd just like to get a picture. You know, we went some went through some hard times, and uh, I know TRA did, and and uh, they're bringing things back up. We're uh, we're about uh, 70, 71, almost seventy two percent uh, funded. Uh, what's the long-term progress here that we're making here on these uh, retirements? Mr. Thompson. Yeah, um, Chairman, uh, Representative. Well, I think uh, TRA is making progress, uh, particularly since the 2010 uh, pension reform bill. We're about 80 percent funded. And I would say that uh, this is a very timely issue uh, to consolidate Duluth. Uh, because of their demographic situation, it's just not the economy and not the market. Uh, you will be in a uh, Duluth will be in a similar situation to what Murph was and Minneapolis was. If we don't take action, it clearly will become more expensive if this bill does not pass today. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Well, seeing and then uh, the chair uh, renews. Uh, my motion that House File 1951, the second engrossment, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. Mr. Chairman, I want to make a comment, which I remind people in every committee this vote goes through. Before I was the chairman of the Government Operations Committee, one of the major House reforms I made was that we would have an omnibus pension bill. If that had, and I insisted on it, and the Senate found that when you do multiple bills and someone has one bill, you end up doing one bill. If I had not done that, count the number of bills we would be going through on this committee. We had 32 separate bills, all of them subject to amendment, discussion, and so forth. So. Well, Representative Kahn, as the chair of this committee, I thank you for pointing that out. We'd be here for, I, just for have, a time. I just have to point it out each time it happens. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Nelson, Representative Murphy. Thank you and, very much. Uh, thank you. We will now go to uh, Representative uh, Newton, special license uh, veteran, special women's veteran mm -hmm. license mm -hmm. plates. <laughs> Welcome back to the committee. We were here thank, the other day. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Representative Newton, I'll um, move that House File 1916, the second engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. And uh, now there is um, an amendment. Uh, do you want to take the amendment before or after you explain the bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, let me uh, please do amendment. the amendment first. Do you want to do the amendment first? Please. Okay. Uh, so the chair moves the uh, A3 amendment, uh, and if you could explain the amendment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what the amendment does is it adds motorcycles to the uh, license plates, so we have them for vehicles, uh, motor vehicles, including motorcycles. And it also essentially brings uh, the um, uh, bill in line with the Senate version of the bill. It's primarily a technical change. 
and it eliminates a surcharge that we had on there for uh, a special women's uh, fund that was going to be monitored by MDVA. Okay, any uh, discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none then, all those in the favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Newton on the bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. The, the bill is very basic. It provides a license plate for women veterans. I think many people don't realize that we have 29,000 uh, women veterans in Minnesota and that the uh, military force for the uh, United States, including Minnesota, is now made up of 15 percent uh, women. Uh, it has changed dramatically from the days that uh, Representative Ron Earhart and I had served when we had maybe 3 to 5 percent of the force was made up of women. You find them in every profession in the military now, including uh, fighter pilots and, and uh, on the line. So um, with that, we're looking for, for some equity for our, our women veterans. Uh, I do have two women veterans here to testify very briefly if you would like to hear from them. Um, with your permission, Mr. Chair, it would be very brief. Okay, uh, we generally don't take testimony, okay. but if they're here, we if, the, if it's very brief, we'll do that. Yes, so. I, I would like to ask them to come okay. forward. I have uh, two I should explain that we generally rely on the testimony taking okay. place in the other uh, committees and uh, have um, the opportunity for questions from citizens, but uh, or to be posed. But uh, if they would like to testify, that'll be just fine. Okay, I, I just want to highlight the uh, the level of uh, quality of female veterans that we have. Uh, You're welcome, and if you could identify yourself for the uh, record, everything we do here is taped. So, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. My name is Jill Troutner. I live in Maple Grove, and I grew up on White Earth Indian Reservation in northern Minnesota. And when I was a high school senior, I was nominated by the late Congressman Arlen Stanglin to attend West Point. And I graduated with a class in 1993, Defenders of the Free. I served in Germany with a Forward Support Battalion, and I competed as a soldier athlete with USA Biathlon and with Military Biathlon all across the world. I made my way home, and I served with the Red Bull Division as a company commander, and I deployed with the Red Bull Division, as so many of our guardsmen do here in Minnesota. Looking at myself and my fellow women veterans, you wouldn't know we had served. There's nothing to visibly distinguish us from the rest of our fellow citizens. As Representative Newton said, I was shocked when I heard that over 29,000 Minnesota women are veterans. I don't see them. My brother made the comment that they're like looking for unicorns. Well, we are invisible and we need to become a little more visible. So for many of these veteran women, having the license plate is a long overdue acknowledgement of their service and it's something visual that can't be mistaken for any one service but their own. Everyone notices a veteran's plate, and everyone assumes that plate belongs to a man. For me, this license plate is a statement of value, that Minnesota, my state, values my service, my patriotism, and my sacrifices in a highly visible way, and that I, that all of us, are veterans. Well, Ken, welcome as well, and if you could <laughs> identify yourself with record. Yes. Mr. Chair, my name is Trista Mattis Castillo. I'm also a veteran who served 16 years on active duty in the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Minnesota Army National Guard as a company commander. And um, I'm here for any questions. I'll just hold uh, there for, for now because I know many of the members of the committee have heard us testify before, but I'm here for questions if needed. Okay. Are there any uh, questions? Re Representative Nornis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Newman, I was just uh, interested. Has the plate been designed? You, I'm just curious what it might look like uh, it, and how clearly it's distinguished that it is honoring the female veterans. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Nornis, it hasn't been designed. It will be designed by MDVA. Okay. And it, basically what it is is at the bottom <coughs> of the plate it will say woman, woman veteran. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, Questions uh, of either the, uh, the two veterans or uh, Representative Newton? Well, seeing none, then uh, the chair uh, renews his motion uh, where House File 1916, the second engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, motion carries. Okay. And uh, thank you for your comments, and uh, thank you, Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Okay, we'll now go to uh, Representative uh, Sawatsky's uh, DOT technical bill, Department of Transportation. Uh, is, is Representative Bernardi, uh, we'll drop down to Representative Bernardi then uh, while we find uh, Representative Swatsky. Uh, this is, um, I think we can call this one of the on-session bills. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Forgot to bring my can of 7-Up uh, uh, with me today for our unsession uh, bill today for transportation. It was supposed to be a joke, but I guess it wasn't that funny. But anyway. I um, meant for all the committee. <laughs> but, but then maybe it's, well, it's getting close. It's not coffee time. Yet, right. so, yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. So I, I brought uh, Mr. Radine with us today, and um, this bill is, uh, is non-controversial with what is in it. It repeals a lot of things, eliminates um, obsolete language, reports. It eliminates some things that cost more money than they are um, worth doing. And it inadvertent, um, for example, one um, report they inadvertently did for a number of years and no one noticed that it was gone. So it seems like it's not probably a necessary report. So anyway, there's a number of things we can talk to you about if you have an interest in them. And um, like I said, Mr. Rudine is here to comment as well. Okay, and I will uh, move that House File 3084, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, so are there, um, did you want to make some, make a uh, game to the desk? Uh, Mr. Chair, Eric Normally Rudine. we would just take questions, but. Sure, uh, Eric Rudine, MnDOT Government Affairs. And Mr. Chair, I would just point out that the fiscal note uh, shows the savings uh, to the state and also to local governments by eliminating some of these reporting requirements. Okay. Any um, questions or discussion? Okay. Well, seeing none, I uh, renew my motion that House File 3084, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed in the general register. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we're, oh, there we. Um, I was about to take Representative Mahoney. Now that Representative uh, Swatsky is here, we'll move back to uh, that uh, that bill. That's House File 2214. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the chair moves that House File uh, 2214, the second engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general. Register. Uh, Representative Swatsky, if you could explain the bill. Okay. Um, good morning, Chair, Mr. Chair, and members. Um, thank you. I've been ran from the basement. So, uh, this is a transportation bill. It's a um, um, housekeeping unsession bill, and I believe that the part that we are referring to is the six thousand dollars that is um, being. Uh, requested for an extension of the um, non-motorized transportation advisory committee which was set to expire this year and then to extend it for four years this money isn't for the department for reimbursement but for those that are on the committee to be reimbursed for their uh, being on the committee and expenses for um, this committee Okay, and uh, by the way, when you reference the uh, funding, um, Mr. Marks, if you could just comment quickly, uh, it's it's not from the general fund, it's the <laughs> Trunk Highway Fund, Mr. Marks. Mr. Chair, that's correct. It's the Trunk Highway Fund that would uh, have to absorb that additional $6,000. Okay, is there any uh, discussion? Well, seeing then, and uh, the chair renews his motion that House File 2014, the second engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general registrar. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. Um, Thank you. Now we will, way. and Representative Garoppolo is on his way. Representative Mahoney, why don't you uh, take uh, your bill then while we're waiting for Representative Garoppolo? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. I would like to move that House File 23, uh, 2384 be referred to the General Register. Okay, and uh, the motion is before us. Um, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, your, I can explain your goal it. Is to yeah, it's a um, it's a bill that needs to sit on the House floor in case of a um, uh, question. Uh, essentially, what this does is that it extends the uh, ability for uh, the Courage Center to continue to do vocational rehabilitation because, in state law, there is a law that says that you have to be a primary. Your primary purpose has to be. Uh, vocational rehabilitation. Uh, when Alina bought uh, the Courage Center, Alina is primarily a health care provider. Uh, we are extending it one year as we work out the Olmstead court decision to see if, th and that's probably when the law will change. Okay, and uh, as uh, explained at this time of the session, we sometimes uh, have a uh, vehicle bill, so you're going for a drive. I would never have called it a vehicle bill, sir. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> and I've had a few of those myself. Okay, any uh, discussion on the bill? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Groffel in the room yet? We do. He's on his way. Okay, so we'll just wait a, uh, a moment. Okay, maybe uh, Ms. Conley just remind me we have somebody from the department here. Why don't we... Um... Oh, oh, here he is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Representative Garofalo, your uh, bill is before us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you move my bill already? Not yet. Um, if but I move. Uh, will move your uh, bill. I'm just... Uh, let's see. What is the House file? Uh, House file... Uh, 284. The chair recommends that House File 284 uh, or 2884 uh, be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Representative Graffalo, if you could explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Very quickly, this is one of the few bills you can have where everybody wins. There are no losers. Uh, what this bill does is it sets up a, a investor owned utilities to offer a new tariff for electric owned vehicles. The reason why this saves everybody money is that right now, if people come home from work and they plug in their electric vehicle at 5 or 6 o'clock, particularly during the summer, they're going to be paying very high rates in the wholesale market. Now, that customer doesn't pay those costs. Those costs are distributed to all of us. All of us pay higher rates. Uh, what this does is it sets it up. It's voluntary for the consumer. Well, they could plug that car in at night. A separate meter would only run during off-peak hours. The wholesale market is purchased at a much lower rate. The customer pays a lower rate. More importantly, all of us who do not own electrical vehicles uh, we benefit from those savings because we don't have those costs shifted onto us. And so as electric vehicles become more prevalent in our society, uh, it's going to save us a lot of money. And just as a equivalency for everybody to know that an electric vehicle is basically like adding a small house to the grid. And so it's a really good bill. It saves everybody money. And I, th I think it's here because the Commerce Department had a, a very minor fiscal note, which I've been advised they've, uh, they've stated they can absorb. And that's my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any uh, discussion on the bill? Okay, seeing none, then uh, the chair uh, removes this motion that uh, House File 2884, the second engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion aye. carried. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, by the way, um, a couple of announcements from uh, Ms. Conley as far as uh, tomorrow is concerned. Uh, very briefly, we meet at 8.30 tomorrow. So an earlier uh, start that's driven by uh, floor session, I think, starts at uh, 10. Mm -hmm. So uh, and we have a number of bills that we need to process, so a little earlier start than usual. <coughs> With that, uh, meeting adjourned.